Awesome. So, um, Luis, thank you so much for making the time to come over today and talk about uh, this very exciting workflow you've been working on. Um, we're very pleased to have you here. I know this will be a fairly short workshop, like an hour and a half, I believe, but this will uh, give us a glimpse on uh, what you're up to and uh, what the future holds for uh, NFTs and 3D geometry. Thank you, Abel. Yes, it's, it's great to be here. Um, it is going to be a bit of a whirlwind. Um, consider this kind of like a, I guess, a, an onboarding uh, tutorial workshop, if you like. Um, but yeah, we have an hour and a half, and I think there's tons to cover. I, I've tried to at least reduce it to the things that I think are relevant uh, and important, although there's all sorts of tangents that we could get into. Um, so let's this uh, let me just move things around a little bit. Um, so yeah, it's I'm, I'm happy to share with you uh, this that we call Decentralized Design Economies, 3D NFTs on Tezos via Hickenlook. And I'm gonna explain what all of these terms mean and introduce a lot of other terms. Um, I'll eventually share this uh, presentation um, and use it as, as you like, I suppose. Um, my name is Luis Fraguada. I work for McNeil and in Europe, in Barcelona. McNeil, if you don't know, it makes uh, Rhino 3D and, and Grasshopper, these kinds of things. I'm a developer and third-party developer supporter. I'm also the McNeil uh, Research um, and Development uh, co-coordinator, co-director, I guess, uh, where we work on Horizon, not Horizon Europe projects and other um, funded research projects. And this is one of our, well, one of my, uh, let's say, areas of, of research, because um, there are, you know, a lot of relevant um, Horizon EU calls um, that could deal with you know, blockchain technology. So this is going to be a little bit the agenda as we go through it. Um, I'm going to do an introduction to some of these terms and, and the technology. Um, then we'll go through and make a wallet, OK? Um, and then we're going to design a little bit. We're going to create an NFT. We're going to see about collecting NFTs. And then we can open it up for, for discussion. So hope, hoping to break this up into 15 minute, uh, 15 minute chunks. Um, I don't know if I can actually. Um, I think, I guess there's like, um, people can chat. So I might open up the chat here um, in case people have questions. I guess there's a Q&A too. It's going to take some, a lot of real estate, screen real estate. But um, this is, you know, considered a workshop. So um, I'd like you, everyone to follow along, um, especially with regards to, you know, wallets and design and things like this. Um, the Design Computation Conference has, and has enabled us to all, all do this because um, we're able to, I'm able to send all of you a little bit of cryptocurrency um, so that we can all actually go through and make an NFT, okay? Um, main point is that you do need a 3D model to continue. Um, we need a 3D model. We don't have that much time to actually model or do anything. So if you have something around or if you wanna open up your favorite 3D modeling application, which I'm sure is Rhino, right? Um, or something else, um, feel free to, to do so and be, be modeling something um, because we, we're only gonna have a short amount of time uh, for that. Uh, so we're to introduce, um, we're gonna start kind of from, from scratch here. You know, what is a blockchain? Um, blockchains uh, rely on consensus mechanisms or algorithms. What are NFTs? What is Tezos? What are dApps? What is Hicketnook? And maybe just start with some relevant examples. So um, what is a blockchain? Probably a term that you've, you've heard a lot of before um, in different contexts, uh, but essentially to, to put it as simple as possible, it's just a growing list of records. If you've ever done any you know, programming and I'm gonna you know, simplify this way too much, you, know, you might have an array of, of, of entries, an array of objects, or, and that just keeps growing. In the case of a blockchain, this array is, uh, or this uh, list is, uh, is I guess, uh, you know, immutable. It keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, and these records um, are blocks, and these are linked together using cryptography. Um, so some people refer to it as a, as a distributed ledger, uh, where nodes collectively adhere to some protocol and communicate and validate uh, new blocks. So 
these in order to for all the nodes in the network to sort of agree on what the status or the state of the network is the state of the blockchain um, there are these mechanisms called consensus mechanisms um, and these are also known as algorithms or protocols but that's what allows the whole distributed um, system to eventually agree upon the current state of the of the blockchain this means that you know one a validator node might have um, validated a series of transactions. The rest of the, you know, the rest of the uh, network has to, you know, has to agree about that. Um, and the way that they eventually reach that consensus is different based on the blockchain. Um, these aren't new things. They've, they've been these mechanisms have been used in, in other sort of um, domains, um, but for um, cryptocurrencies and crypto economic systems, there's been a few new ones invented to, to allow them to work. Um, two, two of them, which you might have heard of, depending on your, let's say, how, how, how deep you've been researching this, um, is proof of work and proof of stake. Proof of work um, is used in, you know, in things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and some other cryptocurrencies. Proof of stake is used in Tezos, Cardano, and a few others. And essentially, proof of work is done by miners that compete to create new blocks that are essentially blocks of process transactions. Um, the winner um, shares this uh, this with the rest of the network and earns a little bit of uh, some cryptocurrency or token. Um, the the key th here is that the race is won by whoever's computer can solve the math puzzle fastest. Uh, this produces a cryptographic link between the current block and the block that went before. Solving this puzzle is the work in proof of work. Um, and this um, and the, the part here is that's important is that it's whoever's computer can solve the math puzzle fastest. So here, your the performance of your computer is really key. Um, so I don't know if you've tried to, to buy a, a, a decently spec'd out um, NVIDIA graphics card recently, but they're kind of hard to come by because um, a lot of these um, these miners run on these GPUs. Um, proof of stake is a little bit different. It, it has its own issues, um, but let's say doing this work and eventually the energy consumption that's behind this work isn't one of them. Uh, proof of stake is done by validators. They stake tokens to participate in the system. Um, a validator is chosen at random to create a new block and it shares that with the network and earns some rewards. Instead of needing to do this intense computational work, you just need to have staked tokens in the network. Uh, it's what incentivizes a healthy network behavior. Um, so, I mean, here, I guess, let's say the, in my opinion, the, the issue with this is that, yeah, you know, you have to eventually stake, you know, put a, put a big chunk of um, tokens up um, to say that you are, uh, you know, a useful part of this network, uh, but it doesn't have the, let's say, energy consumption issues that proof of work does. And there are other consensus mechanisms like proof of space time that's used by Filecoin and some others, but these are the ones that usually get discussed. And, you know, whereas blockchain might get some bad press, it's usually because of this proof of work um, consensus mechanism. So let's go on and discuss NFTs, which we're going to be making one of them today. Um, an NFT is a non-fungible token, so it's something that essentially can't be changed. Um, they can be used to represent all sorts of different media, um, maybe even you know physical things. Um, sometimes it's it's kind of analogous to a certificate of authenticity. I don't necessarily think that that's always the case, but um, so the NFT itself isn't necessarily the image or the um, or the 3D model or the code that is you know, associated with it. The, the NFT is, let's say, a, um, a chunk of, um, let's say, the, what, what, what links to all of these things. It's the, the thing that links all the rest of these uh, things, like an image, to, to the blockchain and to that transaction. Um, this is, let's say, um, op opposite or different to fungible tokens, which is typically um, what the cryptocurrency actually is. So a fungible token is like a Bitcoin or some Tez and Tezos. Um, these eventually that, that token can be interchanged between people. Um, whereas a non-fungible token, while it can be transferred, once it is created and minted, it stays, it stays that way. Um, so we've talked, you've probably heard about Bitcoin and Ethereum and maybe some other cryptocurrencies. Um, I've mentioned Tezos. Tezos is the, the crypto, is the blockchain that we're going to use today um, because it is a proof of stake system. And so we don't have to, um, con, you know, doesn't have the energy consumption issues of a proof of work system. Um, and it's open source. So you can see everything that goes behind it. Um, it's the, Tez is the native cryptocurrency for the Tezos blockchain. Um, 
it, yeah, so it says here like uh, achieves this consensus using a liquid proof of stake model. Um, and what I like about Tezos as well is that there's a governance model that enables Tezos essentially to be upgraded without having to do, um, to fork, uh, to fork things. And, and that's important for many reasons, but um, one of the, well, recently there was a, a fork of Ethereum called the London fork, and that, you know, always causes some, some market instability. Um, but anyways, it's, I think it's a really nice feature of, Tezos. Um, so on top of these things, on top of this technology and the blockchains and everything, you can build some things. Oh, sorry, I guess I skipped over a slide here. But yeah, we kind of already discussed the energy efficient proof of stake algorithm. Um, but you know, some brands are already starting to choose Tezos because of this. Things like there's a, a new platform called One Of, which is a music platform backed by Quincy Jones, uh, Red Bull Racing, McLaurin Racing, etc. They're building their, their communities, their NFT platforms on top of uh, Tezos because of this energy efficiency um, feature of proof of stake. So yeah, on top of these, you can build decentralized applications. And you know, let's say the difference between uh, a D app or a decentralized application to you know, the ones we use on our, on our desktops is that they're essentially run by a network of uh, a decentralized computing system. Um, sometimes the a DApp is interchangeable with what is referred to as a smart contract. A smart contract is essentially the logic uh, which defines the rules behind the transactions. So for example, in an, in an NFT, you might have some royalties associated with the transfer or sale of this uh, NFT. And the smart contract will have the logic for how this royalty, you know, how much royalties needs to be um, distributed. And it does also the distribution of these royalties automatically. Um, there's all sorts of things that smart contracts can do and and I think that's also a kind of a, a topic of discussion is that you know this the smart contract could essentially execute all sorts of code um, autonomously and then eventually you know collect funds distribute funds um, so there's you know there's all sorts of interesting um, applications for these smart contracts um, also something we could discuss at the at the end of the today's workshop so we are going to be using a particular um, D app called Hicketnook here and now, which it means here and now in Latin. It was initiated and developed by Rafael uh, Lima. Um, it's a, he's a Brazilian developer and it's currently maintained by him and a community of contributors. Um, you can go to its GitHub page. You can see how the UI and the smart contract are developed. Um, and it's what we're going to be using uh, today. Um, it allows users to manage decentralized digital assets serving as a public smart contract infrastructure in the Tezos blockchain. Um, so what we actually do is we mint, and we'll talk about what minting is uh, in a moment here, um, is you actually create NFTs, but your media, whether that be a, a, an audio file or a 3D model, et cetera, is actually not stored on the chain. Um, that would be that would be pretty expensive. You can store some, some kind of things on the chain. Um, for example, there's a project on... Um, called Artblocks, which takes uh, processing JS code, and that's stored on the chain and essentially then creates, let's say you can create generative um, yeah, generative art from, from that code. Um, but so the objects that we're actually going to be minting are, are objects that are that are created. And to store those, we're going to, um, Hickenhook actually stores them on the interplanetary file system, which is also a decentralized file system. So your, your, your file isn't on any one particular computer, but bits are um, distributed all around the world. Um, so we'll see a little bit about this as well. This is some of the interface uh, for, for Hicket Nunk. It's pretty minimal and some people really dislike it. Some people love it. Um, but I think what it's nice is that it you know, focuses on the art. Everything else is sort of secondary. Um, and it doesn't have some of the features that I don't like of other platforms, which, you know, there's no concept here of like leaderboards or like who's making the most money. It's really just, you know, enabling um, the creation of, of, uh, of art, which I think is, you know, really, really interesting and really positive. So some relevant um, projects or relevant examples, I think, for, let's say, our AAC adjacent uh, crowd. Um, I want to mention this first one here by Alex Crowers. Um, let me see if I can actually change. Uh, I have to minimize this here and then come back. Yeah, so this is an object um, called Grief. It's a photogrammetric um, scan of a, of a tree. And 
besides it being a, a really wonderful scan and showing that you can actually you know do 3D models um, with some good level of detail, um, Alex created this object. Um, well, for you know, for her own you know, in her own practice, um, but also um, created this object to to donate the proceedings of the sales of this NFT um, to benefit LastStandForest.com, which is protecting Canada's severely threatened old growth rainforest. Um, there's one particular called Fairy Creek, and there is this um, this event. Let's say um, a hen for Fairy Creek. Hen is Hicket Nook, um, and so several artists sort of um, you know promoted this, this initiative to, to put up an NFT um, and eventually donate their, their um, sales, their royalties from, from this uh, to, to supporting this, this, um, this initiative. And I think, you know, you see a lot of that in, in Hicketnook um, and it's something that, you know, immediately you can, you can do this kind of, let's say decentralized uh, autonomous um, organization of, yeah, of um, initiatives. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Although um, decentralized autonomous organization is, is another term that um, the scope of this uh, tutorial, of this workshop won't cover. Um, let's see, there's also NFT House by Galo Canizares. This was the one that kind of got me thinking a lot about, you know, what is the potential for, a, for architecture and, and design and creative practice? Um, so uh, Galo is, a, is an architect and an educator. Um, his, he minted um, a 3D model, the schematic design documents, and the initial renderings, or sorry, interior renderings of this um, of this house. You know, as you can see, it's quite simple. Um, not necessarily discussing um, discussing anything related to context and things like this, um, but but I think what's important is that um, yeah, it brings up issues like you know. What can we do with this? How can we how can we develop this further? Um, and eventually, so this was in March of this year, and since then there's been other you know AEC related um, related things. And the last one I wanted to show was this one by um, Alex Grasser, which I think highlights the potential of the NFTs you can create on Hicket Nook. So it, not only can you make you know 3D models and images and videos and stuff, but you can also uh, do HTML and JavaScript code and those objects that have that logic can actually communicate with each other. So Alex created this real-time participatory architecture uh, NFT, where um, you know if you if you purchase it, you can collaborate on creating this really like aggregative um, 3D model. You know something I'd, I'd be used to during my design research lab days. But um, yeah, so I think this is you know pretty interesting that you can create something and then also create other objects that interact uh, together. So let's talk about wallets and actually, you know, getting our hands dirty with some of this. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. Um, yeah. So what is a wallet? Then we're going to go through making a Tezos wallet and receiving your first transaction. So a cryptocurrency wallet holds one or more kinds of tokens, fungible or non-fungible. Wallets are often interfaces to interact directly with the blockchain or in this case, interact with the smart contracts on that blockchain. Um, so Let's go through and make a wallet, okay? So we're gonna make a wallet with Kukai app. So I have um, some instructions here and some warnings, okay? There's, there's been some ways of some people attacking the way of making this because um, if you Google search uh, Kukai app, you're gonna get a couple of first, uh, first hits that are not Kukai app and they kind of trick you into um, entering in your, uh, your, your information. Um, just out of curiosity, um, I just want to see how many people we actually have here today with us. Um, let's see. Okay, so I see a few people. Um, and just I guess maybe raise your hands if you're gonna if you're, if you're gonna go through and do this with me. Okay, Paul's in there. Cooper, Claudia. All right, so um, that's great, and I believe you have a way. Uh, so we're gonna need to you need you're gonna need to send me a few things. So I guess you can do this uh, via the chat or some other way. But I guess we'll get there when we get there. So um, first of all, I'm gonna do this in Chrome because I already um, I already have my wallet hooked up in Firefox. So I'm gonna go go to a browser. Let's go to wallet.kukai.app. 
So I'm going to copy this to the chat. Um, Adam's host panelist, everyone. Okay, I'm just going to say to everyone. Okay, looks like this. And I guess you have to accept some things. Um, so let's go to create a new wallet. Okay, now here, um, and actually I'm going to open up a notepad. Note. Um, because I'm going to copy down some things here, all right? So here, eventually, you're going to click to reveal your seed words. Go ahead and click that and copy and paste that somewhere into a, into a text pad, okay? I'm going to pause sharing for a second. I'm going to do this because I shouldn't reveal this to you, even though I'm going to throw this away. Um, um, actually, it's, I think it's, yeah. I'm just going to show. You. I'm going to throw this away. I'm actually not going to use this wallet, but so I'm going to copy this into TextPad. Okay. Now it's going to ask you to go through and verify your seed. So you need to look into the, the words that you just uh, copied and find the word, for example, in my case, between survey and match. So between survey and match is pepper. So I'm going to go ahead and do that there. So pepper between wash and mystery. Wash is party, okay. Between mystery and ill is mystery warm. And between victory and fine is treat. And between treat and involve um, is fine. And recovery seed has been verified. So I'm gonna go to next. So we need to create a password, okay? Uh, password is like a last word in this, um, in these secret seed words. Um, so I'm just going to create a password here. This one I will, I don't know, I guess I'll. Um, so eventually it's going to um, open up open up your wallet, or it's actually gonna, well, first it's gonna give you the address. So let's just go ahead and copy this. And so what I want you to do with that address is copy it over to me. Yeah, that's this address I made, but I want you to, and then, well, yeah, first before doing that, let's go ahead and download this. So you're gonna download this hdwallet.tez file, okay? And that's gonna be your encrypted key store, okay? Um, I have something in the, somebody in the chat, okay? So this is, let's say, Greg. Um, okay, so if you could just paste your address here and I'll eventually send you some, some Tez. Paul has a question. Um, where are we? No open questions. No, sorry, I don't. It's just my, my hand was, was up from last time. <laughs> okay. So go ahead and when you see, yeah, go ahead and copy into the chat that, um, and send it to everyone. Um, and send, so I can make a list of everyone who's here. So far, I only have Greg's. Okay, there's Paul. Cooper. Now this um, this wallet address, I mean, it's 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 actually public no public knowledge. Whether or not you tie that to your actual name, that's that's up to you. But um, so you know, the wallet address is like a I don't know, it's like a phone number or or so it's something that you use more or less semi publicly because you're using it to eventually do these transactions. Um, Carlos, okay. Okay. Am I waiting on anybody? 
Claudia, great. Okay. One, two. All right, did I miss anybody? There's anyone else um, gonna join us here? Going once, going twice. Okay, cool. So we have our, let me just make sure to save this. <clears throat> All right. So when you, so first it's important you download this um, wallet, keep it around, keep it safe, okay? Um, and I wanted to also mention about the password. This is not like a, a password that you can then change later on. This password and these seed uh, words are tied together. If you lose your password, you lose all of your tokens and all of your cryptocurrency that's stored in this wallet. If you lose, um, yeah, if you lose the seed words, you lose everything. Um, so your seed words and password essentially are encrypted in here. So as long as you have this TES file and your password um, or the seed words and your password, you can always um, you can always access the wallet. If you lose um, your password or if you lose the, the seed words or if you lose the this TES and you don't know the seed words, then that stuff is lost forever. There's no way to, to recover it. There's no, um, there's no, yeah, password recovery. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go and open the wallet. And I have zero Tezos because <laughs> there's nothing in there yet. So what am I, what am I going to do um, is actually go over to um, here. And seems, uh, so is everyone, did everyone get to a place like this? eventually into your wallet, your Kukai wallet. You see that, um, you know, we don't have any NFTs yet and we can discover other, let's say, dApps in the, in the ecosystem. Another platform for making um, NFTs is Calament. Um, TZ Colors is literally um, unique colors. You can buy a color, um, which, yeah, well, it's a color. Anyways, so it looks good. Um, let me send you some Tez. I actually haven't um, tried this before, but this is a, so this is um, another wallet that I had made um, before this. And um, Abel was able to, to fund, uh, well, the conference was able to fund some Tezos for everybody. So since we've got five, I guess I'll, I'll leave a Tezo in here. I actually sent myself some and I'll send everyone else a Tezo. All right, let's 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 try that around. So I'm gonna do one Tezo. So bear with me. So number one. And so there's a little fee and storage cost to doing this. Um, it's a preview, okay. That's the first one and off it goes. I'm gonna go here and copy the second one. There are tools to do this in a batch, but uh, I thought that Kukai was able to do it um, and maybe I'm just missing a point here. I thought that there was something in the interface to allow you to do multiples, but anyhow. So it takes a moment to execute everything. And the password that I had entered in before is the password for my, uh, my wallet and the password that you made. Um, okay. So there it goes. Um, let me send another. Um, so you can see, you can actually send to different kinds of things. Tesos domain, so you can actually register a specific Tesos domain. I have uh, forguada.tez tied to mine, or you could do a Google account, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, actually. Um, so let's do maybe an advanced. Multiple transactions. That's what I thought. Okay. Let's address amount, address amount. Okay. So we could do this. One. I already did you. Okay. 
Let's see if this works. All right, in a single transaction. Okay, let's see if this is going to. Fortes, okay. Confirm. <laughs> That's a little bit better. All right, so. So Greg, Paul, oh Greg, you should have probably by now received yours. Yes, all right, good. <laughs> Paul, Cooper, Carlos, Claudia, you should have something incoming soon, okay? Um, while we're here, um, for example, here you see this view and explore. So I can click that and I go to this TZKT, okay? This is kind of like another interface to see all of the transactions that have been made. Um, you can see the stuff that you've sent, you can see the stuff that you've received, uh, even like, you know, tokens you might have. Um, you can search the operation, so you can, this is the actual operation of, uh, let me see, this one, is, I guess, is, uh, um, this is the one I sent to, to, to Greg eventually here. Um, so you, this actually is an operation that you can, you can check out and see what's, what's going on with that. Um, so yeah, you see all the information here uh, related to all of the transactions. There's a, something that I got mine, Paul's got it. So everyone else should receive theirs already. Um, so this is a, an interface created by a, a group called Baking Bad, which makes also like an API you can use to interact with the Tezos blockchain and you know, a bunch of other tools. Um, so if you use Tezos a lot, you'll hear a lot about Baking Bad. Um, there's here you might see that it says not delegated and you also probably see it over here and um, not staked. Staking is that I take my tesos that I have. Now I have, you know, from six, I have 0.6 now. <laughs> so from the tesos that I have, I can actually give my, um, let's say my, my governance rights or my voting rights to a baker, one of these bakers that validates uh, transactions on the network. So if I find a baker that um, I'm aligned with with how I think Tezos should evolve and develop. Um, I stake my my Tezos with them, and I get some reward every couple of days, like 0 0.0 something Tezos, depending on how much Tezos you actually stake. It's usually it turns out to be like about five percent or so um, APR. Um, let's say over AP over the year, um, average percentage over the year. So you get five percent. Um, let's say Tezos back if you stake with somebody. And, and my main account, I do have it staked. Um, so it's, again, it's, a, it's another dimension of this that we're not gonna necessarily get into, but that's, that's why it says not staked here or you know, not delegated over here. Once you delegate it, and there's plenty of things to, to give you information on how to do that, um, then you start receiving like um, every, every week or so, or every, I don't know, some, I don't know the, the period, but every week or so, it seems, you get some Tezos back, which is pretty cool. All right, so everyone's got their uh, their Tezos. I see it all went over there. So that's your first transaction. All right, nice work. Um, anyways, uh, I go through these things and I put warnings on you know what where we should be careful. Um, and you received your Tez. Great. Um, let's go back to this. So uh, design design time. Uh, let's look at the supported media on Hicketnook. Um, we're going to create a model. It can be with Rhino, Grasshopper, or whatever. Um, that's not a tutorial necessarily about that, but um, Rhino will will come into play here in a moment. And then we prepare the three model for minting. So let's go. Um, so Hicketnook supports a variety of media formats. So GIFs, of course. You know NFTs are often associated with GIFs. Um, Images, so JPEGs or pings. Uh, you can also do scalable vector graphics. Um, I think what's great, well, here I think I have a, I think I linked to an example of each. Um, let's see if they, they come up here. But so, of course, a GIF, you know, everyone knows what a GIF is. Um, but SVG, I want to I wanna look at SVG for a moment because, yes, we know that there are scalable vector graphics um, and we can export vector graphics from. Tons of other, 
tons of different um, platforms. But let's see if it actually comes up. Of course, it's being very slow now. Um, anyways, we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But the point about the SVG is that actually SVG is like a, as a markup language. If you've ever actually looked at how the SVG is written, so if you open it up like in a, in a notepad or something, you'll see that it looks a lot like, I don't know, HTML or, or XML or something like that. SVG, the, the, the standard for SVG actually allows you to embed HTML and JavaScript inside of it. Um, so what was great when SVG started to be supported on Hickenlook is that you saw people doing these interactive and generative scalable vector graphics files. Um, and of course, it's probably not going to it's probably not going to show up now for some reason. Uh, maybe if I look at it somewhere else. Um, another thing that must be said about Hickenlook because it's open source, it's run by you know a very um, condensed team of, of people. Um, yeah, it goes down sometimes. It's not, you know, we, well, we just heard about Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram going down. Well, it goes down a little bit more often than that. I hope it's not the case for us today. I think we'll still probably be able to mint and do a few other things, but um, uh, we'll see what the status is when we get around to actually, uh, actually minting something. Hopefully it'll allow us to, to do that. Um, so, Anyhow, um, so there's some really interesting examples of SVGs with, with code inside of them. Of course, videos, um, 3D files. So using um, a project called Model Viewer, which itself uses uh, 3JS, which is a, a WebGL library. Um, you can upload a GLB file, just like we saw with, um, yeah, with Alex's, uh, Alex's model here. Yeah, this is a GLB. Um, you can do audio, MP3, WAV, or FLAC, PDFs. Um, so there's a PDF that I'd eventually like to show you here by uh, Rosa Menkman, who's an artist that I that I admire. Um, okay, I see this dot come up a lot. And I think the crowning jewel of uh, Hickenlook is that it supports HTML as a zip archive. You can do HTML, JavaScript. Um, you can have data in there or you know, additional 3D models or any other kind of data. You zip all that together and it actually allows you to create you know, whatever kind of HTML inside of, this, inside of this little sandbox. Now you can run JavaScript, um, but you only have a certain list of like APIs. If you want to connect externally, you only have a very limited set of APIs to connect to. So you can connect to the website itself. And that's how um, Alex Crasser did this uh, sort of real-time collaborative architecture um, NFT that I showed you. Um, so it's one object communicating to another object, but because it's on the same website, it's, it's okay uh, because it's on Hickenlook. Uh, but it doesn't, for example, if I wanted to, I don't know, right now, I don't think, for example, OpenStreetMap API isn't supported. So like if I tried to call OpenStreetMap or I don't know, maybe even, I don't know, some, some other kind of API that's not on the, on the allowed list, then it would, you know, it would, not let you call that to kind of constrain and, and it's kind of a safety vector to just allow any sort of code to be executed. So they do sandbox a little bit um, the what you can do there with HTML and JavaScript. And as of recently, they added Markdown, but I haven't seen any uh, any you know objects that that use Markdown. So um, yeah, let's create a three D model. Um, I here in um, so yeah, in, in Rhino, I already have some kind of grasshopper definition that I had from a, another project. Um, so it makes, it uses this really nice multi-pipe component that we have now in Rhino 7 grasshopper uh, to create, let's say, a, so I make a box, a bunch of points in space. Um, I make a connectivity network from them. Um, and then I eventually just reduce the number of lines, create this uh, sub D multi-pipe a mesh, um, do some stuff. Like here, I just do a really cheap occlusion. I blur it, and then I take the brightness value and make this pretty thing. Um, that's not the scope of the workshop, so <laughs> so do you know have your own model available, but whatever. This is the model I have. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, eventually here, I'm going to bake it. All right, and here it is. And I'm going to export it. 
I guess not extort, <laughs> export. Um, just as a Rhino model. I'm gonna just straight up use a Rhino model. Let me just do this on the desktop. Um, I'm gonna call it Lattice. Okay. Export, you could have saved it because there's nothing else in the model, but I'm gonna export it. Um, so now we need to prepare this model. So hopefully by now you have something. Um, and we need to go through and do a little bit of preparation on this model. So we actually need this model to be a GLB file. And um, we do have a, a GLB export plugin um, for Rhino. You can actually uh, find it by installing it in the package manager. So if you go to the package manager and you look for um, GLTF, um, eventually you're going to find um, you're going to find something. I think hopefully. Oh, sorry. This, this is my dev machine. I removed the, the public yak um, repository, so I just have this internal repository. So yeah, things like potato and test things. <laughs> so, anyways, if you do this, uh, you should see package. If you do, if you search for GLTF, you should see our GLTF uh, work in progress project there, which does allow you to export GLTF. There's also um, a project called uh, Triceratops. Um, and that allows you in Grasshopper to save out, I think, like a 3JS uh, format. Anyhow, so next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to go to the 3JS editor, and we're going to I'm going to import the 3DM file directly in there. Um, I wrote a 3DM loader for 3JS, and that's uh, part of the the editor now. Um, we're going to set that environment in there to model viewer, and then we're going to make some final adjustments and save the model as a GLB. All right, so um, 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 it's over here. Um, another thing that I wanted to um, to mention is that, you know, I used Rhino, you know, desktop Rhino. I have the same definition, more or less. I, I tweaked it a little bit for the, um, uh, but it's going to ask me here for a. It's going to ask me here for a. For your oh no it's, it's here already all right so I have the same definition running on our on our Heroku server connected to a Rhino compute server um, so I could you know imagine you could do a, a your own let's say generative platform where you allow people to to create their own model and instead of like I don't know going to download and getting the the, the file here that could be you know a button that allows them to to create this 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 model or to mint this model on the on the blockchain to create an NFT for, uh, from it. And a lot of people are doing this now. They're creating their own platforms where people can interact with different elements. And eventually they can, let's say, mint a new piece from this generative work um, to be eventually traded and sold on um, the blockchain. This is happening on Ethereum, for example, with uh, Artblocks. It's happening a lot more now with Tezos um, and different projects. So I think that's also kind of an interesting possibility. Um, so I have this model already. I'm going to go to the 3JS editor. I'm going to import the model. Uh, where do I have it here? Yeah. You can see it's pretty small. It's less than a megabyte. There it is. Um, by default, it's kind of you know, rotated around. I mean, I guess I would be the only person that knows that it's rotated, but um, I'll just go ahead and do that. Maybe I'll actually do it 90 degrees and pretend it's uh, some kind of generative uh, table or something. It's got three legs. That could work, no? Um, I'm gonna change the environment to model viewer, which should, there we go, look at that. Look how pretty that looks. All right. Um, so the vertex colors come through. That's good. That's what I like. That's what I wanted. Um, and here, let's say, let me click on my object. You can do other tweaks here. Like you can change the uh, the material if you like. For example, I might turn down the the roughness to make it a little shinier. Okay. Make this give this some kind of ooh, kind of shiny aspect to it. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dwell too much more on that because. We should be done designing uh, by now. We should be on to creating our NFT. So I'm going to go ahead and export this as a GLB file by going to File, Export GLB. I'm going to save it as well somewhere. 
um, here for now on the on the desktop. I'm going to call it lattice. Okay, and we have uh, our lattice GLB file. Um, Um, so that's really what we need to prepare the model for minting. And now we can move on to creating an NFT. So um, let's just go to hicketnunk.xyz. I'm going to just paste this in the chat so you can. Um, That's the, that's where we're going. And here's Hicketnunk's front page, which is just like an endless stream of stuff. Um, other platforms uh, to get on the front page, you need to be featured. Um, and there was recently kind of a scandal on, on one of the platforms uh, because uh, employees of this platform were trading um, NFTs are buying NFTs before they were featured. And of course the employees know which ones are gonna get featured. But here, everyone's featured for a few seconds, you know, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get featured. Um, we're almost up to 400,000 objects since March. Okay, this is since March of this year. Okay, which is pretty nuts. Anyhow, um, so you see up here where it says sync, um, go ahead and press sync. It's gonna ask you which wallet you wanna sync with. I'm gonna say Kukai wallet. Okay, it's gonna open up a tab with Kukai. No problem, Greg, it's fine. Um, this is my main account. Um, and I actually want to sync with another one. But eventually when you do this, you should get a, a little window that's gonna pop up. You'll see it here in a moment. Preparing complete, waiting for permission request. Um, I'm waiting for permission request. Establishing connection. We should get a little pop-up that allows us to sync. And you choose your account and you say approve. Establishing connection. Hmm. Is everyone else also in this establishing connection or did they get some pop-up on, on their Kukai wallet? Looking at the chat for your impressions. Let me see if I can do this again. Okay, so you got asked to grant permissions. Good. All right, so Paul, if you go back to Hicketnook, do you see your, your kind of wallet address up here? Okay, that's great. So I think it just could be my, um, not seeing the video playback. Not sure which video you mean, but okay. Um, Greg, not sure which video you're talking about. The MP4 you uploaded? Where did you up? Okay, we haven't minted yet, but maybe you're already uh, ahead of us. So um, let me do this one second. Just close up these guys here and let me go and um, go to my settings and remove my permissions. Uh, remove all. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And I'm going to go back to syncing. Okay. And complete. Waiting for permission request. Hmm. 
All right, one second here. Let me see if I can do this slightly differently. There we go. Okay, so I'm now choosing the account that I want to. Okay, that I'm wanting to connect with. And there we go. Now I'm synced my account. So um, let's go over to Object Mint. And so I'm going to give it a title like Lattice, a description, a lovely Lattice. So I'm going to say like 3D um, Lattice um, Workshop TLB. Grasshopper, Rhino, etc. Whatever you like. Now, additions. Additions is how many of these do you actually want to make available? They could be one of them. They could be up to ten thousand of them, etc. Since there's, um, I guess, total of six of us here, um, let's yeah, let's let's make six. So you keep one, and you give one to everybody else. So I'm going to put six, and royalties. Let's just make it twenty five percent. Um, so that, you know, in the future when these sell, um, yeah, you get 25% of that. So I'm going to go to upload object and I'm going to find, um, my lattice, which is in the desktop. There's the lattice GLB. Now, um, when it's an object that isn't an image directly, um, it's going to ask to, you know, upload a cover image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, um, I guess to 3JS over here where it looked looked really nice in the 3JS editor. Actually, it probably looked better in, in Rhino. Oh. Okay, stop. Let me, um, I'll just take a screenshot of that. Okay, I'll just save that somewhere. <clears throat> Come on. Okay, it's not working that. So, you captured a file. Sorry, I gotta make things look somewhat decent. All right, you capture the file. I'll say that not super high res, something, something like that is fine. On the desktop. So yeah, if you have like a, if you have like a audio file um, or something that isn't, or like a PDF, it might ask you to, you know, do a preview image so that they can preview it um in the interface so there we go now we can preview this and there it is okay and it's a lattice a lovely lattice okay so anyone else that did a 3d object getting something like this Now, Greg, it should show you the the um, the MP4 here. I guess this is where it would show it to you if it were showing it to you. All right. So, um, if that looks good and you have everything written there that you like, then let's go ahead and press Mint Object. So, all of these um, actions require interaction um, with the with Kukai. So, um, Kukai here has a little pop-up message is saying confirmation, do you want to do this? Um, and I'm going to say um, confirm. Okay, and I'll take a moment here to, oops, the wrong password, hold on a second. It's going to probably do this.
and entering my password. All right, so it'll take a moment here for things to happen. If you're, um, and you see that Kukai has a, um, yeah, Greg, it should eventually show up in the creator tab. It might take some time um, to do that. Um, if you're somebody who, um, yeah, who does web development, you might be used to looking at the web tools and stuff. So you might check here, um, yeah, just what's happening with the network, uh, um, the network um, movements, if it's uploading stuff or passing stuff back and forth. So it's there. And then if you really want to see the ultimate, let's say the, the ultimate, uh, um, evidence that it should be into your, into your creations, you can go back to Kukai, you can see what's happening over here. So first, uh, we called this this mint object, which is an entry point into the smart contract that uh, Hickenlook has, um, which you can see on GitHub. So we've called mint object, it's confirmed. So if I look at here, um, again, TZKT, we can see that eventually I called, I had this internal call to mint object. Uh, then there's a call to to make to Hickenman NFTs. So it's multiple contract calls that happen at the same time, or one after the other. And then once it's applied and it's confirmed, you can see this little check that it's applied the transaction. Um, sometimes things might fail for some reason, but in the, this case, it seems like it went through. Kakai should update it. And eventually you see that I've minted six lattice here. And um, I see it in my collectibles in my now it does I don't think it does a great yeah it just shows like the the preview image. Um, so now let's see if I go back to my manage assets and creations. This is where we might see something or we might not see something. Um, why might we not see something well. Um, Hicketnook, as you, as I mentioned earlier, has you know four hundred thousand, almost four hundred thousand objects, and in order to be able to um, have all of that information and be able to you know serve it to you in a in a more or less you know clean way or a way that is um, fast, let's say, uh, it uses what's called an indexer. Now the indexer um, was also run by another person. Um, a uh, person by the name of Marching Square, that's the pseudonym, I guess. And was they were doing this for, you know, for free in a way, uh, just as a service to the community. Now, this has been in transition to um, another group of, of developers and sometimes that indexer might go down. And if it goes down, then the, let's say what we have made um, and what we have, um, yeah, what we've, created might not show up here, okay? But as we see in the wallet itself, okay, we have our, we have our lattice right there, right? We have whatever, whatever it is you made um, right there. Um, so it is, um, it has been minted, it's on the Tezos blockchain. It seems like we might not be able to, um, to see it just yet. Um, um, I can go back to the front page and see which, which number they're on. And I can kind of, compare that to, I think here in TZKT, I can check the, the transaction itself and it might show me which number, which object number, I think it's this one here. So if I dig into this kind of stuff, which I like to do from time to time. So this is telling me like, this is my, this is my address. I minted six of them. Um, and eventually I think somewhere in here, it might even tell us the, the object number. So it's probably this one, 399,543. So we're getting super close to 400K. Um, so I can go back to the front page and see that they're on 398,000. So the indexer hasn't gotten to us yet. Okay, there's some something that for whatever reason it hasn't, um, hasn't arrived yet. So unfortunately we're not gonna be, probably be able to do what's called swapping, which is actually putting it up for sale Okay, um, I don't know if this one shows it here to us. Let me see if I can actually see this object. Um, yeah, so I don't have this object for sale, um, but if this was you know, our object, we'd see another tab here called swap, which would allow us to say how many objects we wanna swap and for how much, and do another operation with the, um, with the wallet. 
Um, but here's how, let's say, a typical um, a typical object looks like. You have the art. Um, this looks to be like um, just it's a yeah. This looks to be a PNG. Um, you have some of the metadata, etc. So the tags. You can see who's owning it. So this person hasn't swapped it either. Um, they have 10 editions, they've minted 10, and you can see the history. So this person minted this object um, on October 5th, and they put, they made, they minted 10 editions at 25% royalties, okay? Um, if we had some other object, like, I don't know, um, let me see if I have um, some interesting object here. Um, Or I can even I can go back to Mr. Reborn's page, and this is what a typical um, typical artist creation looks like. I can go back to like collection, for example, and see what their collection is like. So you can see like what other people are collecting and how are they doing. But let me go to this this one for example. So this was 334 editions. There are 13 editions left. Um, you can see. First of all, a couple of things. If we go to listings, these are all the people that have purchased it and are making it available for sale, okay? So for whatever reason, um, all these people bought it, but you can also put it up for sale again. Um, and these are all the people that own this um, NFT, but they just own it, it's not up for sale, okay? Um, you can see the history. So if we go all the way to the bottom, you see that MVDRA, um, put this minted this object on the 9th of September. They made they minted 334 editions of 10 percent royalties, and they swapped um, minted 334. How can you swap a thousand and one test? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, anyhow, so there's a bunch of them here. You see everyone picking it up for very cheap at 0 0.01 tes, and eventually at some point. Um, of these trade operations, we can see that, um, oh, I know why it says 334, because that's another thing. Probably this person minted a thousand, but then did what's called burning. Burning is when you take a certain number of additions and you throw them away in a way. So essentially this person made the this NFT be, a, you know, instead of a thousand copies, they made it to be 334 copies. And burning means you send this to a particular address on the Tezos um, particular Tesos address, which is uh, called the so-called the burn address, okay? Anyways, um, if you wanna collect something, or let's say right now we'd be swapping. So swapping is here. Um, you probably don't see it yet because the indexer doesn't seem to have been indexing anything yet. Um, anyways, you'd see another thing here, it's a swap. You'd put how many additions and then how much you wanna swap it for. You'd click on swap, you'd go to Kukai, You'd accept that and then you'd go back to um, here and eventually it would update and, and eventually allow you allow people to collect it. Okay. Um, if you want to collect, um, for example, this one here um, for Fortes, for point Fortes, you can click here. I mean, I'm not going to actually do it, I'm going to click so you can see what it looks like. So I click there, I go to Kukai, and you see that. Um, it shows me what I'm spending. It's going to be four tests it's showing me the fee and the storage costs. Um, and it's going to transfer that. Um, I'm going to transfer that test from here to this uh, uppercase KT addre uh, address. And this is essentially the address of um, Hicket Notes uh, smart contract, if I'm not mistaken. The smart contract will take care of passing this test to the person who has it up for sale. And then we'll take also care of transferring the the NFT that I've purchased um, and pass it to my to my wallet. Um, I'm not going to confirm because I don't want to don't want to collect that at the moment. Okay. Uh, what I am going to do is since it seems like we're not going to be able to um, do this um, because it's not updating, the indexing isn't updating, and we're not going to we're not getting anything here. Um, and we don't see our our token. Um, what we can do is actually I can send these, I can send a lattice to you um, straight from the wallet. So I can actually go here to lattice and I can actually send it. Um, I'm going to send it to, um, I can only send one at a time, huh? 
thought I'd be able to send it to, to multiple. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to send you a lattice. So I'm going to click on the token and then say send. It doesn't seem like I can actually send it to multiples at the same time. So I'll just go through and send it individually um, to each of you. So Greg. So this is sometimes referred to as, um, so I have to say how many I want to send you. I'm going to send you one. This is often called airdropping because you're you're not going through the the interface and the person you're just giving it away kind of for free, um, and it's going to land in this person's uh, wallet. Sometimes people do this to, you know, to give thanks to somebody or, you know, maybe you somebody bought something and it came maybe with an additional NFT that goes along with it. So that's also possible. So I sent it to one, I'm gonna send it again. Send one to this person. Is this the same one? KW, yep. Okay. So I'll go through and send that to everybody. Anyways, we're getting pretty close to the end um, of this. Um, and the next part was gonna be about, you know, collecting um, and I just want to make sure I send this to everybody. Is it invalid? Okay, that has the space. There we go. Um, two more to go here. There is a, there should be some tools to send this. I, I don't understand why you can send the currency, but not tokens like this in a batch. And one more. Oh, I got something going on here. Another operation was in the mempool. So maybe it didn't, uh, wasn't able to finish sending all of these. I have four left. So it seems I was able to send it to 6K KW unconfirmed on USN. Okay, let me see if I can send this last one. Sometimes it doesn't like sending so much stuff at the same time. All right, so 6K KW SN. It seems Carlos, something happened with yours. Okay. Transfer. So is there some, I think Carlos, you still might not have your operation might not have gone through. Let me see. USN 7G. And yeah, I think I'm missing Carlos here. So let's do that. So um, because this object probably hasn't been, and please, please feel free to, uh, to send me something if you want. Um, here's my address. Well, you have my address, but um, if you were able to mint something and you have something here, um, please uh, 
share the love and send it back. Um, so yeah, I think here, Carlos, it'll take a moment to finalize. Oh, it confirmed it. All right. So you saw that there was a transaction there that that failed. Maybe I was sending too many at the same time. I mean, there's also tools to to help you do this kind of stuff, but um, yeah, that happens from time to time. And it's updating that. And as soon as I think that finishes, then Carlos, I think you should see the lattice in your in your wallet. So um, there's other things like maybe you've already started working with cryptocurrencies, but there's you know Coinbase um, that allows kind of an exchange. So the difference between an exchange and a wallet is that ex exchanges um, become an entry point to exchange, you know fiat currency like euros or, or dollars or pounds into cryptocurrencies, whereas a wallet is more like it holds this stuff, you know, um, it holds my cryptocurrency, it holds my, my collectibles, etc. Um, so on Coinbase, I don't think you can, I mean, it, it does make a Tezos wallet if you have Tezos on Coinbase, but it doesn't, um, I don't think they support holding NFTs in there. Um, so that's why we use this Kukai wallet, and it's just a way to um, to better uh, interact with um, the different dApps that are around. So um, yeah, it seems it's taken a little bit, Carlos, to to update here, but it seems. Um, let's see one, two, three, four, five. It seems that it went through, and it's just taking a little bit. Okay, so you got it. Good. Now, what about you guys sending me something, huh? I'm not, I'm not seeing anything coming in here. Let me see some of that stuff you guys made. Um, anyways, so you sent yours. All right, cool. Um, so maybe it's going to getting an in-balance address. Just make sure that there's no spaces or anything behind. Okay, just try to make sure, because that happened to me with one of them. I think it was a space, and it's pretty... Pretty gen, pretty sensitive with that. Anyhow, um, I'm gonna go back here so we can kind of land um, land this. So we didn't get to see swapping NFTs, but um, maybe after this, uh, maybe tonight or tomorrow, you can go back to Hick and then you can go back to your um, your manager assets and you can see your assets there. If you go to collections, you're gonna see this, this lattice that I sent you, that'll show up there as part of your collection. Um, and then you can eventually go through and see what swapping is about. I also detail swapping in here, so you can um, follow the instructions to, to do that. Um, and collecting, well, you know, collecting is, um, yeah, you could send, uh, eventually, if you had your object URL, you could send it to us. We can go to the page and we could collect that object, but we you know, just airdropped it to each other. Um, and yeah, I also, you have to be synced. You have to eventually go to other people's profiles. And, and Hickenook itself isn't great for searching around. You know, you have the, um, the front page and then you have this kind of search, which is okay. I mean, you can see like, what are, you know, some GLB objects. And eventually it'll come up with like a bunch of 3D, some 3D objects. So, I mean, that's kind of cool, but there's other tools like, um, I don't know, other tools that are, are good to, to check like um, object.com, which is an, an alternative UI to Hickenlink. So you can do most of what Hickenlink does, but you can do it from this interface um, if it ever actually shows up. Um, and next, which is again, another alternate, uh, alternative UI to um, Hicketnook. Um, here's object.com. Um, and eventually you can put, you know, the object ID or the, the artist. I don't know if I actually post my, if I post this, if it shows up here, sometimes it shows up on object.com earlier. So let me see if it actually comes up there with a, object ID or something, might and might not. These use different indexers, so stuff might show up here or not. Um, and next is another UI um, that shows the, um, but you know, these now it's starting to show like, you know, top sales and this is the kind of stuff that I'm not so interested in. Um, anyhow, 
Um, so I'll share this eventually with you. Let me just make this shareable so you actually have access to the, the notes. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to open it up now to any, any comments of like, you know, do you think that this could be, um, let me open this up to uh, anyone, but you know, just open it up to anybody. You know, do you think this could have some um, impact on how we do how we you know do creative practice? Um, and share in the chat. Yeah, there's other stuff that might be interesting to discuss, like these decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, in my wallet, actually, there's um, um, in my main wallet, there's something here called HDAO, which is Hikidnok Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And I have like 20 of these tokens. And the first 45 days of Hikidnok, for every sale you made or everything you collected, um, any transaction you made, um, actually you got some some of this token, this uh, Hikidnok DAO. And, and it's really used for like, now it's not used for much. And you can like upvote kind of different pieces. But um, they also used it in the first uh, Henvo, which was the first sort of community-driven um, governance of Hikitnook, which happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's essentially, yeah, giving you giving you um, access to voting and things like this. Um, yeah, there's collaborative contracts coming, and you can split royalties. Um, and I put a link here to the Henvo. Uh, but other things that I wanted to discuss are like, you know, this, this notion of Web3, which is, you know, kind of where there's decentralized applications all over the experience of the web. And what are the consequences, positive or negative of this? You know, like with Web2, we saw a lot of, you know, social media come on board and the social, sort of social engineering of things like subscribe buttons and like buttons. And with Web3, you know, that, that button could be associated with your wallet. So, um, you know, I think that there's some positive things about decentralizing these kinds of economies. I think there's also some things that we need to watch out for. So I think we need to leave the, the let's say the negative experiences of web two um, about, you know, FOMO and um, fear of missing out and, 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 you know, follower counts and all this, you know, leave that behind um, and kind of embrace the decentralization and the economies that can be made by, by these decentralized apps. Um, and yeah, and I think you know, there's a lot of opportunities here for creative practice. Um, hopefully, you see some see some as well. Um, I don't know if there's any comments, but um, I yeah, I need to to just thank you and and thanks for bearing with us. It's too bad that we weren't able to to see our our object show up there on Hicketnook, but it's there. We see it in our wallets, and um, and yeah, we should uh, check back. Don't you know keep that information you know with you and and check back. Um, in a in a bit and see if it's see if it shows up there. Um, a lot of the conversation around this is happening really on on Twitter. So whether you use Twitter or not, you know that's that's one thing. But a lot of people are the community is there. There's a Discord for Hicketnunk um, that you can find, um, and there's also a, I think like a a Discord and a discourse uh, for Hicketnunk. So all that's out there. If you have any questions, you know you can always contact me or find me on Twitter uh, at Luis Fraguada or contact me here at, at McNeil. So anyways, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and um, yeah, see you see you around uh, Tezos and uh, a D app in Web3. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Luis. Fantastic, really super interesting, super, super interesting. I have a quick, two quick questions. One is, is there inter-blockchain interoperability? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is what's called, um, often called wrapping. Um, and there is wrapping of tokens. It's pretty convoluted with regards to Ethereum and Tezos, for example. But on, on Ethereum itself, there's wrapping of tokens and and like side chains and things like this. But right now there's not a, a, a whole lot of interoperability between, for example, Tezos and Ethereum. Um, I think Ethereum is, tr is eventually moving to proof of stake at some point. Um, it seems it's getting yeah. closer. Um, but right now you, there's platforms that allow what's called side chains that are proof of stake. So you could, uh, an artist might choose to, you know, be on an Ethereum platform, but they use a side chain to actually mint their stuff and then kind of sidetrack the, energy consumption concerns, but the wrapping of tokens, is some, it's possible. I just don't recall. It seemed really convoluted. 
Yeah, and then my other very quick question is, uh, can you embed NFTs in other NFTs? Embed NFTs and NFTs, yes. Um, so people made NFTs that allow you to mint, at least mint other NFTs. So they're like generative and then you mint it. So it's, yeah. it's, it can, it's embedding the logic of creating new NFTs within an NFT. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it's certainly possible, I think. I'd have to think about how to go about it, but I think some people have done this. I'd have to come up with some examples, but I think it's possible. Cool. So we have uh, one minute left, theoretically. Uh, so uh, guys, if you have any questions, Louise, have a few seconds left <laughs> to give you attention. No, I think sorry it was you know so quick you know it's I think we covered everything and I think with the with the slides you can kind of go back and and see the steps and especially the the swapping and the and the collecting I think something like um, hennext and object.com are I think better for for discovering artists and and you can like check the prices and things like this it's a little bit more more helpful for that yeah not so much for the, like the leaderboard stuff which I really don't care for yes. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, Abel, and uh, hopefully we have more opportunities to uh, to do this kind of stuff uh, together in the future. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Louise. It was fantastic. I am super excited about uh, the new uh, landscape of NFTs and uh, and to use three D geometry for that. Thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. See you. Bye. Everyone, if you want, you can switch your cameras on. Uh, Carlos, Claudia. I'm going to try to switch my own. If you want to uh, discuss anything. Um, I thought it was super interesting. Yeah. Uh, so how do you feel? Yeah, it was really nice. And it was actually not that difficult. <laughs> so it, yeah. Yeah, the process was really easy to like uh, set up everything and um, upload the model. Yeah, pretty fast and easy. Yeah. Nice. I mean for, for me, it was the first time I, I, I was in, in contact with this kind of, of thing. So <laughs> I was discovering a different world, but it's really, really interesting. And, and the potential of that in the future, I think that is going to be big. Yeah. Yeah, Paul? I, I, I thought it was very interesting. I mean, I, I never had contact with NFTs. And uh, what can I say? I learned a lot of new stuff. So. Mm -hmm really enjoyed it yeah it's it's all is starting all the blockchain block dog you know dlt uh for this type of application for you know content management and and uh, uh content ownership and so on so it's it's super exciting and uh, i just imagine how you know uh your intellectual property as a 3D model is going to change with uh, with uh, the advent of this technology, but also you know how we're going to use uh, build information modeling in the future, and for that matter any other form of uh, uh, content information modeling, because you can have this build up of uh, intellectual property uh, using blockchain. And it's, it's very interesting, you know, and people are you know, minting soundtracks, but also sound effects, you know, sound waves uh, and layers within 3D objects, layers in, within uh, 2D pieces of artwork. So it's very, very exciting. It's, it's all taking shape.